Welcome everybody. I'm Michael Borowick, an Assistant Secretary of the Australian Council of Trade Unions and one of two union representatives on Safe Work Australia. Today's discussion is on workplace violence is not okay, keeping our emergency departments safe. Firstly, I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal. I acknowledge and pay my respects to their continuing culture and, their contrib and the contribution they make to this city and to this region. Each day, our frontline workers, our first responders in any emergency, our police, fire and ambulance officers and our healthcare workers face serious risks to their health and safety from occupational violence. This is simply unacceptable. And importantly, it shows we are still collectively failing to meet the most basic work, health and safety right, that workers are not harmed as a result of doing their jobs. The acute and accumulative emotional and physical toll on workers, their workmates and their families from occupational violence is huge. In part one of this series, which we released in October last year, we heard from our first responders as they shared with us their very personal stories of the impact of occupational violence on them. Unfortunately, these stories do not represent isolated incidents, but rather experienced daily across Australia. Today, we are going to focus on violence against healthcare workers. A recent study undertaken by Monash University found that two thirds of nurses, midwives and personal care attendants had experienced occupational violence in the previous 12 months alone. It is estimated that one in five victims of occupational violence in healthcare report it. This occurs for a range of reasons, including the lack of co-worker management support, lack of management action, and the common perception that violence is just a part of doing the job. The idea that healthcare workers should think that being subject to abuse, aggression, or physical assault was just part of the job is deeply disturbing and says much about how we are addressing or not addressing this important issue. Importantly, there is currently no systematic, comprehensive and user-friendly reporting system for this information, which I think is one of the many reasons that this issue is not getting the attention it deserves. I'm sure we'll hear more about this today. Occupational violence against first responders in healthcare enforcement and emergency services is a growing problem. As these individuals deal with people in extreme circumstances, people who are distressed, angry, confused, or under the influence of alcohol or other drugs. I acknowledge, as do other Safe Work Australia members, that this is difficult and a complex topic, a truly wicked policy problem with huge financial and human costs. But we need a systematic approach to start tackling this problem and tackle it now, not wait. Occupational violence does not respect state boundaries, political ideology, limited budgets, and it does not operate neatly within occupational silos. Decisions made in the legal, justice and health domains will impact upon each other, whether we like it or not. Policy decisions made at the national and state levels and most directly by organisations will play out to varying degrees in workplaces right across Australia. We all have a role to play and we need to work together. Governments, both federal and state, must consider how policies they make will impact on the ground. 
Our work health and safety inspectors are very aware of the problem. In my own state of Victoria, WorkSafe Victoria is undertaking campaigns to increase awareness of this important issue and actively working with organisations to help them improve the prevention of occupational violence risks and management of the aftermath when unfortunately incidents do occur. All work and health and safety regulators will investigate and where appropriate prosecute if a serious incident occurs. While investigations by our work health and safety regulators can reveal important information about why and how the incident occurred that organisations can then act on, everyone here would agree that it is pr far preferable if organisations implement effective risk identification before the incident occurs. And of course, they should actively monitor if their risk control processes are really working. Public and private health providers need to ensure they recognise and address the issues and wherever possible, design it out. Use the hierarchy of control, not rely on de-escalation training alone and ensure they systematically introduce effective prevention and management controls. Think innovatively about solutions and involve those who are most affected and, usually, and who usually have great ideas about how problems can be fixed, the workers and their unions. So today's discussion, I hope, begins national, state and, of course, organisational level discussions. I'm looking to, forward to hearing from our panellists and taking these insights back to discuss with other Safe Work Australia members. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our panellists. Tiffany Plummer is a registered nurse at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne with 27 years experience. She chairs the Aggression Prevention Management Committee and coordinates the hospital's aggression prevention program and takes part in investigation of serious incidents. As a member of the Department of Health and Human Services Violence in Healthcare and other important reference groups, she knows what's going on across her state. Jared Hayes has been deeply involved with the Health Services Union and the New South Wales healthcare system for over 30 years. Initially, an intensive care paramedic, and now more recently, uh, a HSU delegate and secretary of the New South Wales branch of the HSU since 2012. Since then, he has presided over high profile campaigns that focus on the safety of workers in hospitals and in other healthcare settings. Jared is passionate about working with health service workers to improve their safety in New South Wales hospitals. Patrice Wallace brings a perspective from one of our work health and safety regulators. She delivers a range of prevention programs for WorkSafe Victoria. With a background in physiotherapy with extensive experience in delivering work health and safety strategies in both the private and public organisations, she knows from personal and professional experience how important this issue really is. I'm sure that the Victorian lessons are equally applicable across Australia. Finally, but not last, uh, in any terms of importance, of course, the man of the moment, our facilitator, Mick, Mr Mick, Nick Housko. Nick is a specialist facilitator for the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources. Passionate about facilitation, he's a director, memberships and chapters on the global board of the International Association of Facilitators. I think you'd agree we're very lucky to have him here today. In 2013, he was designated a certificate professional facilitator by the International Association of Facilitators. Would you please join me in welcoming our panellists today? Well, thank you. Tiffany, Gerard, Patrice, thanks for joining us today for the panel. Um, as Michael so articulately pitched it, 
the workplace is becoming quite violent in the health area. You're in the front line at uh, Tiffany at St Vincent's. Would you mind giving us a little bit of an insight of what that front line's looking like today? Yeah, so we've certainly noticed over the last two or three years an increase in aggression incidences, particularly yeah. occurring in our emergency department. Um, we collate data that kind of over the last few years has certainly shown that increase. And when we look at why there's an increase, it's, it's complex and it's not just one reason, but there's things like we are seeing people with um, multi-drug um, issues, whether that be um, methamphetamines, um, alcohol is still certainly a very big problem in our community. Where St Vincent's is situated, um, we're sort of a city-based uh, hospital, but sit just on the outer around an area of called Fitzroy, and we deal with a lot of homeless people. So um, a lot of uh, the patients that may uh, experience or show clinical aggression often have a whole range of homelessness, mental health, drug and alcohol issues going on. So, um, and also I think it's important to remember when these people come through emergency, um, they get admitted and they go up stairs and so their aggression or clinical aggression continues um, not just in ED it but doesn't stop at the front it door. doesn't stop at the front door yeah. yeah okay Jared what are you seeing from a broader viewpoint you're obviously got many members who are in the health workers area you must be getting some interesting and uh, quite surprising results coming in and feedback from your workers. It's unfortunate that it's not quite surprising. It's quite predictable. Okay. Uh, society has got a lot of pressures on it. So whether it's a drug and alcohol issue, um, there's ice issues, and we can talk about that later on, that uh, is, has been put as a, a, a main cause. It's a growing cause, but the main cause clearly is still alcohol. Um, we see that from the paramedic point of view, uh, when they do attend a scene, bringing patients in. And we've got to remember at the end of the day, these people are all patients. So there's a bit of a difference to uh, normal law enforcement. Uh, but the, from the security personnel, the clinical staff in the hospital, yep. uh, this affects right through. And the point was just made, it's just not in the ED. It's right throughout the hospital. ED? ED, oh, the, the emergency department. I'm just going to have to pick this up on okay. jargon because I know the industry lives in it. And yeah. I want to make sure that our audience can understand what we're going with. So, much and, and I want to really make the point clearly that what we see um, exhibited in the emergency department through drug and alcohol uh, presentations, through mental health presentations, uh, we also see anxiety from family members. Now, yeah. in, in, in New South Wales alone, in the last 12 months, uh, the uh, Prince of Wales Hospital Maternity Department had the right squad to it. Had the, uh, riot the riot squad, squad turn up. So, wow. And the same thing happened at, at uh, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in the uh, geriatric department. The riot squad turns up. Now, drug and alcohol isn't the issue there. Family anxiety and other matters come into place. But these are not areas that you should have to have law enforcement um, exercising their role when it is a health setting and people should be able to be managed in a, in a health way. Okay. So Patrice, um, Patrice, from the uh, regulator's point of view, and you're coming from the Victorian base, what, what's some of the in information that you're seeing now coming across your table, giving an insight as to how you might regulate this industry? There are changes, obviously. Yeah, so um, the Victorian Government and WorkSafe and the Department of Health are all really focused on this issue um, now. We had a, we've had a couple of... Um, uh, Auditor General reports occur over the last couple of years um, looking into health and safety and specifically um, occupational violence in healthcare. Um, and so we, so there's a real focus on it. There's a number of task forces and um, advisory groups and reference groups have, that have been set up to actually address the issue. Um, but from, from WorkSafe's perspective, and, and WorkSafe has actually set up a dedicated industry-focused team, which is my team now called the Health Practice Team, to really focus on healthcare, um, along with like our, our other major risks, so construction, earth resources, um, major hazards. So they've really decided that this is a, an industry that we really need to focus on from a risk perspective. Um, and so the information that we are getting is from these reports, but also we've done a number of research projects through our research partners, and Michael alluded to um, some of that um, earlier. And we also run, um, we, we have an inspectorate that, um, team that actually 
do 500 visits every year, um, specifically focused on occupational violence. So we collate all that information and analyse that to see what's really happening in the workplaces. Um, and so what we're seeing, when we pull all that together, what we see um, are some common themes, and that's lack of awareness and recognition and prioritisation of, of the issue at leadership level, but also throughout. So when you talk about leadership level, what level is that really? Is that board level? or Board level, executive level, and actually throughout, because we know even the frontline workers have that um, perception that it's part of the job. So that wow. awareness or recognition that even clinical aggression is... Um, occupational violence and something that we need to address and um, is is what we're seeing. Okay. Yeah. And so the other things we're seeing are obviously the underreporting. We're seeing a real reliance on lower order controls. So just focusing maybe just specifically on training and not the design controls that we know can have a better effect. Um, and our incident investigations, when we're looking at those, when we go out to our visits, we're seeing a lot of um, pretty poor incident investigations, which is obviously a real missed opportunity in terms of understanding the real causes of what's going on and, and preventing those um, causes. And the what, last thing I want to say is um, Tiffany talked about, you know, moving patients through the system and the other thing we're seeing a lot of, which uh, is the lack of um, transfer of information. So often we know known triggers or um, management strategies, strategies for dealing with um, to you know, to help de-escalate or prevent yep. issues, and that information we don't have good systems and processes in place for passing that information on along the line. So, if we had done that, a lot of incidents could have been um, prevented or managed to a, a lesser degree. So, it begs questions around policy, what government should be doing, Absolutely. those sorts of activities. But before we go into that, because um, it's easy to get bogged down into the policy stuff, I want to get a little bit more understanding mm -hmm. of. Someone comes in to the hospital and yep. they are suffering from, let's say, a mental health depression issue. Yep. Who brings them in? Yep. So we have um, some really good partnerships with our local police and yep. we do um, even training with them. Um, and so normally if, uh, say, a patient's been brought in under um, with the police, yep. um, they'll normally give our triage nurse a, a phone call and uh, to warn them, to warn them that they're, they're bringing in. They'll yep. give us an ETA, an estimated time of arrival. Um, and then our triage nurse um, will then um, call it what's called a code grey, which is um, a, a code that we use to deal with clinical aggression of a patient. Um, the team arrives and we will escort that person under a code grey from the So when they get given the a place, code grey, does this yep. mean... Staff respond in a special way. Staff respond in a special way. So there's a team, okay. we have a team of six at St Vincent's, but that varies depending on personnel availability and resources. You know, yep. smaller rural hospitals don't often have yes, security. We'll go to the rules. But um, so our team will arrive, um, we will bring the person into what we call a bar room, which is a behavioural assessment room. And basically it works like a resuscitation room of their behaviour. And we decide, you know, through consultation and discussion with the patient, with the handover from the police, what the right way to treat this patient is. And we do it really with as much respect and dignity that we can. This is a person who's normally under acute distress. Yep. Um, and it may be if we're dealing with a behaviour that is unsafe, it may mean that that means that we give a chemical restraint of some sort, which decreases the risk of harm to them. And then once that's given, they're moved into the main department um, where they're really closely monitored, so no, what, normally one to one. So what happens there with the police? When, so what's the police that interchange? Give, yeah, How does so that the police happen? give us a handover. And really, once they've given a handover, the, the patient belongs to us. They okay. become part of St Vincent. So we normally get the handover. If the patient is maybe handcuffed, we will have the handcuffs removed. We may need to st still use a physical or mechanical restraint while we're putting an IV in to give um, a chemical restraint, or we may even just do a, an intramuscular restraint, a chemical restraint. Um, but it's really, at that moment, you know, you're looking about safety. It's about risk and it's safety to them and safety to others. And others is other people in our department, so other patients and other families. Um, and it's also about making sure that their distress isn't prolonged. Okay. You know, um, someone really aggressive is under a lot of duress. Yeah. So, Jared, yeah. your workers in your area would be seeing this on a fairly regular basis. Mm. What 
are some of the concerns? What are some of the risks that you see, particularly from a government point of view, where they need to be looking at what are the investment processes, what are the things we should be doing? Not to ignore it, not to let it stay as usual, but to actually take it and try and really control it so that we can lessen the impact, lessen the risks on workers. I, I think the, the point's just been made. If, um, if, if a policy is followed, and there are good policies out there, um, th uh, treatment and, and the care of a patient is generally well done. Unfortunately, it's not resourced. It's not seen as a priority generally. Uh, so what is in the policy isn't necessarily what's going to occur. Um, and that occurs in sort of large metropolitan hospitals and also uh, to a larger degree in regional hospitals. Okay. So people are doing what they can with what they have and clearly what they have is not enough. We've just been through uh, one or 12 months worth of consultation following the shooting at, um, at Nepean Hospital where a police officer and a security officer were shot. 12 Could you just elaborate a little bit on that? 12 months ago. What was the trigger? The trigger was there was an ice related patient uh, and um, not with, without getting into the, to the uh, particulars of the matter, uh, it became a very volatile situation very quickly. Um, people reacted particularly well, both clinical uh, support staff uh, and others. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter was, there is, no, there is very little proactive um, support and strategic investment in security. And we look at security as a clinical, part of a clinical function. It's, it's not similar to security that you would see at a, an entertainment facility or something along those lines. So the, the resourcing needs to be undertaken. And here we are 12 months later, we haven't seen any dramatic increase in resourcing. After that Nepean After that incident. Nepean incident. And Nepean's one, we've seen a nurse killed at, at Bloomfield Hospital in Orange, uh, New South Wales. Uh, a patient was killed at Kempsey Hospital in regional New South okay. Wales. And recently, uh, a resident was killed in Morissette Hospital in New South Wales. So these things, and these are dramatic things, but let's say on a day-to-day -day basis what occurs, uh, nursing staff are 12 to 15 times more likely to put in a claim through work-related violence from a workers' comp point of view. Wow. Ambulance paramedics are 15 to 35 per cent more likely okay. to put in a claim, and that claim get accepted. Over the last six years, there are approximately 3,700 workers' comp claims have been made by nurses and paramedics and been accepted, which represents about... That's in New South Wales? Yes, in New okay. South Wales. And that re represents about 7.2% of the total uh, claims. So it's a significant amount, and it's growing. So what we're saying to governments and regulators is that this is an important part of the clinical function in the hospital, if you get it right, uh, it's not a police function. The police should hand over and be able to move on. Yeah. But if it's not resourced, we hope for the best. Now, recently in New South Wales, we've been to the Industrial Relations Commission on a work health and safety matter because of this very issue that police come, a patient is uh, handcuffs are taken off, one security officer is left to look after that patient, that security so officer and nurses just get Just take us through that security officer. We hear that term. Is that the people that are just walking around with their security badges on in, in, in general, like the, the, the people outside here out of this room today, or are they trained security people in that space? So, I mean, I um, also work as an after hours coordinator, so yep. I attend Coke Rays as, as part of that role, and we have um, uh, in-house security personnel and a security team, and they are absolutely integral to the functioning of our hospital. It begs the question, is there enough of them? No. Right, okay. <laughs> no, but they are amazing, amazing resource, um, but they are absolutely seen as a part of the clinical team okay. in, in regards to particularly security and code grey. So that's yeah. what we're referring to when we talk security? Yeah, yeah. very much okay. so. And, and one good thing that the uh, New South Wales Government Ministry of Health has done as a result of the last 12 months is they've introduced a, uh, a health security uh, training program through TAFE so people, when they come into the workforce, are trained in terms of understanding health, as opposed to maybe working as a bouncer and maybe working somewhere else. It needs to be part, as I said before, of that clinical function that is going to support clinicians to be able to look after a patient yeah. in the best okay. possible way and understand what they're doing. Okay. Patrice, in your space, thinking through, as a regulator, there's a bit of carrot, there's a bit of stick. Okay. You've got to be able to enforce but also encourage people to do things. 
are you doing proactive training, working with boards at a level to teach hospitals how they might do things? How are you, how are you getting your message through to those who make decisions? Yeah, so um, we're actually running a really innovative program at the moment, um, which we're calling our Hospital Intervention Program, um, where we're actually engaging with um, hospital boards to help them um, improve their safety leadership and culture from the top down. And we know that obviously if you start from the top, then that can filter down. That's the same with any kind of business thing. Um, but that program's really um, interactive. We start with senior managers from WorkSafe going in and presenting to the board and then, and then our team go in and do some work with the health and safety teams in the hospitals, mapping where the, what their current state is and helping them come up with sort of actions to really address, focusing on culture and, um, and leadership. And then, um, and we're sort of halfway through this program. Um, and then what we're doing is bringing all that information back to the boards. So senior management from WorkSafe come back to the boards again with um, the health and safety team from the hospital around what they've found and what they sort of are suggesting to do. And then the end of this program is going to end with a, a forum where the hospitals, we bring the board and the senior exec executives from the hospitals together in a forum for everyone to share what they're doing. So and I think that's really important because we're saying if everyone's trying to address it by themselves, yeah. that's, you know, that, that's just everyone either reinventing the wheel um, or, um, you know, we're not learning from each other. So that forum, we're really looking forward to that forum about sharing and trying to really facilitate that across um, the organisations. So yeah. as we're talking at the moment, we're talking about our own localities. But this is a national issue. It's an international issue. How do you see some of the things happening from a national point of view? And Gerard, I'm looking at you first. Mm. How do we take things like, we, I think there's a code black that's operating nationally mm. on how we deal with things in hospitals at, at the code black level. In the code gray, I understand that's not being displayed and not being run as a national standard, but could be. Mm. What are some of the things that you would like to see happen there at the national level? Oh, look, I think Patrice has just summed it up. I'd like to see, uh, um, peak bodies not continuing to reinvent the wheel and do very little about it and spend a lot of uh, dollars to be able to uh, attempt to resource yep. that. We need to have a consistent strategy right across the board. In terms of, I, I use the term sort of security, I'd like to use another term because I think there's a better term to use, I just can't think of what that is at the moment. <laughs> but um, in, in the hospital setting, whether it's in the ACT, whether it's in Victoria, yep. uh, Western Australia or New South Wales, there are similar approaches in a different way. Uh, consistency of approach is the answer right across the board. Uh, and I think this is something that, from a peak level, uh, we can start to filter through. And I think this forum that Patrice mentioned is going to be very important along those lines. Yes. The, the, the repetitive spending to get to the same answer makes absolutely no sense. And I think we've, as I already said, there are some good policies in place, but they're not resourced. If they are resourced, and then there's an extension of those policies. Uh, I think things will go very well in the future. And I think the important part is what we do in the next year or two years will have great effect and great benefit over the next 15 years, which is going to be moving a lot quicker than we're seeing at the moment. Okay. Tiffany, are you concerned a little bit about the fact that you get staff from all over Australia to come mm -hmm. and work in the hospitals? How do you make sure that you've got those standards operational across? Now, you're just working from yeah. one hospital but you've also got rural and regional. What happens out there? Yeah, I think rural and regional, it, it's still a, a problem around under-resourcing and you've got emergency, um, like satellite um, departments where there might only be one or two staff members. And you um, were saying six, was it? The and we actually have, a, our code grey team is made up of six um, personnel. Yeah, so, so if you've only got two so working overnight. So someone comes into the, the Gan Main Hospital in New South Wales. Yeah and it's got a night nurse on yep. and one or two so staff. They may, so they'll obviously have to use the police, but maybe the police might be at a, you know, a, a car accident or some sort yep. of other accident. Um, so then they might need to utilise their fire um, um, officers, but again, they Gee. might not be. So, you know... It's a bit then tough. It, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Jared, is that something you can reflect on? We discussed briefly before we came in here that there was a an issue at Wellington in New South Wales. Did you want to elaborate a little bit it's, on that for the audience? Ab absolutely. The, the issue is, 
it, you can be reactive or proactive. Uh, we can look at places like Bathurst Hospital, which have a huge bank of monitors. They can record everything that went, went, went on. But the fact of the matter is it's not going to prevent anything. It'll be used later on in a, litig a litigious way. That doesn't resolve the problem. And this is where in investing in monitors is good, but you've got to have someone who is actually going to be able to intervene prior to issues occurring. Uh, when we do look at places like Wellington, who do have uh, issues in relation to alcohol ice, as many uh, country towns do, uh, a police officer or officers may be out of town and you know, four, four, two to four hundred kilometres away sometimes wow. doing work. Yep. Uh, can't get there in a reasonable time, so what are we going to do? The answer in New South Wales at the moment is we will have potentially cleaners who will act as security people. One, they probably don't want to. Two, uh, they're in a situation where they will respond once the issue has occurred. We need to prevent that issue occurring and that can only be done by adequately resourcing and treating this issue as a serious issue. The other thing too is education within the health system is really important. I think if you went through all the clinicians, all the allied health professionals and a range of other people yep. and said, what is the role of a security officer? And you'd probably get a hundred different answers, but all thinking they have powers to uh, retain, uh, restrain people, detain people, uh, potentially search people, those things don't exist. And we need to give people the understanding of being part of a clinical team is very important. These are the uh, powers and abilities that these people have to assist that clinical team, and then we can move together, you know, move forward together. But Trace, the rural and regional areas, how are they coming onto your focus from a point of view of just, you've got to put down statewide standards? Sure, and so, yeah. Um, so we include, um, so, so we have regional offices, so our inspectors, um, so all of our programs we do regionally as well as in the metropolitan areas. Yep. Um, and we, part of the um, program I was talking about before the leadership program, we actually have a number of um, regional hospitals that are, are participating in that program. Um, and so we're doing presentations, so we'll be going out doing some presentations, for example, to aged care forums, and we will be going to three regional areas as part of that as well. So we, and we even go and work in the regional areas as so well. We, from are we seeing workplace violence happening in the aged care system as well? Yeah, absolutely. And a lot to do with dementia patients. Yeah. So we're actually also working really closely with Alzheimer's Australia as well to try okay. and... Because they have some great resources um, and around, particularly around design things. And one of the... Um, Felicity, my team, was the other day, was telling me about one of the design things that um, one place one put in place. When you've got a patient with dementia who just wants to go and catch the bus and leave. And so they get real... You can imagine if you Anxiety. need to catch the bus to get home to look after your child and you're being stopped the whole time. So they built a bus stop in their courtyard so that person can sit at the bus stop for three <laughs> hours a day. So, Or other good examples are you have walkways that they can just keep walking in but they stay within the business uh, the building so it keeps so there's a lot of design stuff that Alzheimer's Australia give guidance on which is really great at actually helping prevent um, aggression in that space. Now Tiffany you were keen to contribute to that. Oh, I just when we look at our data on um, you know reported physical assaults on staff um, there's a large a large percentage of them happens in our subacute or our aged care facilities. And there tend to be um, the lower level um, injuries like musculoskeletal or, or scratches, but they often happen around, you know, hygiene um, movement um, when a new person comes into a facility. But aged care um, and occupational violence is very closely linked. Okay. So is reporting the issue, the fact that I think there's only one in five incidents that are reported? Yeah. So getting that sense, I'll go to Jared on your, on your people giving you that information. Surely we seem to be well and truly under-reporting. Is one in five even too small? Uh, under-reporting is one thing. Uh, reporting that um, uh, just doesn't have uh, an end to it is the most important issue. In New South Wales, one of the good things that's come out of the, this uh, security roundtable is the fact that um, senior management and uh, government officials all agree that the current reporting system just does not work. Uh, it's 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 con convoluted. Uh, it's it's um, it's not 
getting back to people and, and addressing the concern, yep. let alone going to a point of working a way to prevent it happening again. And so a lot of people get to the point of, well, why would I, why would I waste my time going through this exercise which may, may take me half an hour and A, it will go nowhere, I won't get a response and certainly there will be no change of practice. So this is something that is vitally important to, to get change, you must be able to deal with the relevant information and that, again, it goes to a resourcing issue. Yeah, okay. So looking at that, stepping ourselves a little bit into the future, what do you think is going to be happening that are going to be some of those key changes that you'd like to see happen? Now, Tiffany, you're at the coalface, I'm going to go to you first. So I would like to see um, a better way of um, integrating some of our systems so that our alert systems are across organisations and even health organisations. So, an so an example might be a patient that comes to say St Vincent's and we know this patient, we've got an alert system on their file around their violent history okay. um, and it doesn't mean that every time they come in they're going to be violent but it means that there is a history that gives the clinical staff some awareness that they might need to look the after their environment or what are the triggers for that and yep. hopefully they'll go and read some more information about it. But what about if that person presents you know, to, the, to another hospital or to a rural area? Okay. How do they find out about that information? Yeah, so there's no linkage of sharing. Of of sharing. Yeah. And, um, and I think my, my other thing would be to have Code Grey made a national standard. I don't think Code Black is enough. Could you explain Code Grey a little bit more in detail? So Code, code Grey is kind of that step beforehand. Code Black is a national standard around unarmed and armed um, patient aggression or, or aggression in a hospital, and it, it entails police presence. Code Grey is a step before that. It's the, the, the re resource that a hospital provides to deal with patient aggression. Um, and that's where we have a Code Grey team. So that's a relatively new coding, yeah. is it? Well, St Vincent's has actually had it for about 26, 27 years. Wow. So we, we've had it okay. established in our hospital for a Not long so time. New. But the standard, it actually became a standard in Victoria around about two years ago. And we've seen, um, you know, most hospitals now have Code Grey um, in some form or another. Does New South Wales have this? They have a similar system, yeah. Right, okay, but it's not known as a code grey, so we've got different versions, yeah. okay? And I think just the fact that it's been standardised and there has been some issues implementing it in, and you would expect that. It's, it's, we've had it for a long time and we've certainly played around with it and changed the mix of the team over times and, you know, it, it's a kind of fluid process, but I, I think just having a standard that all hospitals have to look at yeah makes it a big difference. So if you've got nurses moving around from different organisations, yes, at least they know what the basis of a code grey is. Yeah, okay. Yep. Jared? Well, it, uh, if you look at what the Bureau of Crime Statistics say over the past six years, we've seen assaults on hospital premises increase by 5.8%. Now what that in numbers terms means, on any given month, it will be people assaulted between 25 and 61 per month. And they, these are assaults that the police are involved with. Now, if that's 5.8% over the last six years, and you're asking about uh, 2025, yeah. well, we've got to kick that up to probably about 15, 18% of people who will go to a hospital seeking help, seeking assistance, workers trying to give care and assistance to people, and nearly 20% of them or, will, will be assaulted. And they, the injuries that will come from that will be significant. So I think Here's, here's, the, here's the warning bell now to say if we can do something nationally, collectively and strategically, we can address this. It will not happen if health and safety of workers, clinicians, everybody else in the hospital setting is put at the end of the food chain though. Yes. And we understand that the, the health system is under stress, yep. but it can only get worse and you will not attract and retain people to stay where they find it acceptable to come to work yeah. and go home injured yep. or go to hospital as a patient. You're not expecting that when you turn up to work. No. Patrice, you've got that regulator stick, you've got the regulator carrot, and you're looking to see how you can actually move the industry forward into better practice, um, safer spaces for the workforce, less incidents. How does that start looking in terms of programs of activities that you might want to be adopting going yeah. forward? Well, I think, um, 
we, we, what we really want to see on the, uh, the, the bigger picture is just a change in attitude and behaviours to the actual issue, so recognising that it's not part of the job, it's not acceptable. Who's, Even the, Whose attitude's got to change? Everybody. So employers, so the, the workplaces, the employees about, you know, it's not part of your job to actually have to um, be exposed to this on a regular basis. Um, and the community that, you, you know, some, some of the aggression that's actually happening um, is from patient family members. And we understand that that's because there's frustration with the system and all of that yep. sort of stuff. But somehow we've got to We've got to protect our frontline healthcare work to, workers by making it clear that it's not acceptable, and um, and I think f we, we're about to launch our really exciting community awareness campaign, yeah. which is trying to look at all of those things. And we're hoping, what, I think, that that campaign you're de developing a campaign now. Yes, in in partnership. When okay. this is really exciting because it's the first time we've done this, and we know WorkSafe Branding, WorkSafe in Victoria does really great awareness campaigns and it'll include TV, radio, outdoor and all the the things that go along with an awareness campaign. But we're doing it in partnership with Ambulance Victoria and the Department of Health and um, so it's the first time we've we've done that and um, we're really hoping to get a really big impact on changing sort of attitudes and, and behaviour around occupational violence. But also we then want to piggyback off that yep. and say, right, now we've now we've got awareness, now all these programs we're putting in place, let's get action from you know, we, we're updating our guidance at the same time. We're doing some more research to understand things like linking patient safety with worker safety, so then we can kind of raise the profile there. Um, so that's kind of where we want to go. Yep. Um, and and we'll still have the stick, we'll still have the enforcement bit, but we still want to get really strategic and keep developing those partnerships and working together on it across the whole of government. OK. Gerard, really. if I could, asking you about the international perspective. I know the unions just don't look locally, that you've got a, a good international network. What's happening in other countries? It's, it's a broad range of uh, what's occurring. The same problems are occurring, and what we're seeing locally, nationally, is, is occurring internationally. Um, I've been um, going back to uh, Toronto very shortly um, uh, in, uh, in Canada to talk with uh, people there in relation to their approach. At this point in time, they've got the same systems that we have. Um, you go to the American systems, you have armed guards, you know, in, in the hospitals. That's not the answer. And uh, again, it's a clinical setting and we need to be able to deal with this in a clinical way. Uh, the Canadians seem to be moving the same model as we are. But I think, you know, it, we are living in a very fast world now. Information yeah. is very, very quick. Very Change happens incredibly fast. So we've now got to be not only able to ad adapt our, our legislation um, appropriately and nationally, not and just quickly. on a statewide. We've got to do it quickly. Yep. We cannot keep sitting back saying it's acceptable for people to get injured and we will get around to it. I think that's just, it's just the greatest um, sign of disrespect to people who are out there giving their all, caring for the community. Yep. And I think that uh, from a global perspective, I think everyone's talking the same terms, but certainly there's a whole different range. Australia's got the greatest opportunity in the world. We've got one of the best health systems in the world. Uh, we just need to focus on this aspect a lot more than we are at the moment. And we're having lots of trouble attracting medical staff. We're always hearing stories about not enough nurses, not enough doctors, all this sort of stuff. I guess workplace violence would have some impact on people wanting to sign up and, and come in. So proactive programs that actually protect us against the workplace violence are key, would you not? Absolutely. Uh, you know, it starts, I think, even in their education of our of our workforce. So, you know, um, it, it, looking at what universities, are, are how they're training and educating our, our sort of junior okay. and student nurses, I think yep. um, that needs to be looked at as well. And then... Is it in their training program? Not really. Not really, it's sort no. of a de facto... Yeah, so we've, uh, what we've noticed is that it's not. And so we do work with our um, student nurses at, at, at each year level. And then with that, we do a lot of work and training with our graduate nurses. Yeah, and you know, the push is really first and foremost about personal safety. Yep. And um, I'm really fortunate to work with an organisation that really, that is, and it, and it starts off with safety is my responsibility. You are actually your own first responder to every incident. And even if you call it code grey, 
um, security might be two minutes away and a lot of harm can happen in two seconds, let alone two minutes. So we really um, do a lot of work with staff realising. And when you're working with staff who are absolutely, you know, there for the wellbeing of their patients and they have a lovely sort of duty of care, um, that can, you know, th there's this balance that they have to find, what's my duty of care and what's the, my risk to self? And that, that's an issue, you know, and, and how do people work through that and that's not an easy, you know, there's no black or white around no. it, but it's making people aware about some of the decisions that they make when they actually, you know, have that first confrontation or, or interaction yeah, with the that person. Must be the first I one mean, that's the basis, that's where it happens. When you first the experience it, of it, that must yeah. be a, a, a leave yeah. lifelong impression. Yeah, and if you've got a, an elderly man who's aggressive but he's going to fall. There you go. That's a dilemma. Yeah. So do you let them fall and break their hip? Or do you protect yourself? Could I go out to the audience now and find out if there are questions there? Because we've been talking fairly solid, solidly for 40 minutes, I believe. Questions? We've got a few. So I'm going to pin the questions down. The first one here and the one at the back will be in the blue shirt. The microphone will come to you. Thank you. That's been a really interesting discussion. Patrice, you talked about um, some of the physical design of buildings in aged care facilities. And I was wondering whether there's anything, any work's been done on the physical design of emergency departments and whatever in hospitals. Obviously that's not on, the only sort of solution, but can that be part of the solution? Um, we actually, it was, it was in our reception areas in our specialist clinics where we had some incidences of aggression and when we spoke to the staff they actually said they sit quite low and people come and often use their height and the fact that they're standing to intimidate so we did a redesign of the specialist clinics reception areas and raised all the um, reception staff so that they actually look eye to eye when people come and it actually you know that's a very simple environmental design but it makes everyone equal really quickly you know, so just simple things like that can often have a big impact. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think that there's um, a number of things we've seen when we're out, um, and and if you're just talking specifically about the emergency department, and I think the St Vincent's emergency department has quite a lot of design um, controls in place, but even things like separate accesses for when people do come in drug and alcohol affected in the bar rooms that Tiffany was talking about, but. Even things like limiting access to areas, um, having safety glass, um, um, and we do have a really good example of one of the hospitals, and I think a, a number of hospitals are doing this, but a full redesign of their emergency department, which included physical design, but also systems and processes and patient flow, and they had um, a, took a really structured approach to redesigning the flow and moving people physically through the department, providing information about waiting times, providing information about what happens at each point in time, having footsteps on the floor to tell, and coloured curtains to say where they weren't, internal waiting rooms so people aren't sitting not knowing what's going on. So a full redesign including processes and information that had a significant impact on not only reduction in in violence, but also in their throughputs, in their patient satisf in their patient satisfaction, and their staff morale. So that was, and I, I don't think that the only one's doing that, but it is. Um, it, there's definitely many design steps. things that can happen, and good examples of things that are actually happening already. Okay, I'll go to the gentleman at the back there, and then you want a question, sir? Right up. We'll get a microphone to this. Yes, uh, my name's Peter Butler. I'm the um, senior manager of protective security for ACT Health, and I'm also the uh, chairperson for the International Association of Healthcare Safety and Security. Um, so I've done a lot of research through my organisation and f uh, based on overseas data and some of the Australian data uh, around violence and aggression. And one of the biggest issues I'm finding and that we're trying to combat as a senior manager is educating our clinical staff on that violence is not acceptable. Um, we've had external consultants come in to do um, you know, enterprise risk assessments, and you know, we've identified that violence and aggression is our number one uh, risk for our organisation. Wow. And yet our number two risk is the, the lack of under-reporting by our clinical staff. And when I get involved with the police and our clinical staff, you know, and, and to look at uh, you know, the levels of violence and aggression and the assaults against our clinical staff, 
the biggest thing we need to combat is they didn't really want to do it. They, they, they couldn't help it, you know, they weren't feeling well. How do we educate our clinical staff that violence and aggression is not acceptable in the workplace? Because until we can educate our staff firstly on actually reporting the violence and aggression and then actually trying to do something about it, we're, we're trying to fight a losing battle. Yeah. Can I say that? I think that's a really important point. Um, it's violence and aggression in the health setting, and, and I think clinicians need to understand, it's still something that needs to be dealt with. And as we all know, very little money will flow unless there's some significant data and statistics to support that. So it's, it's reporting these sorts of incidents isn't trying to um, uh, give the patient a hard time. It's about actually trying to build the system and, and identify where the shortcomings are. So if these reports aren't occurring, and you know they may be happening 20% of the time, but you know they're only sort of reported 2% of the time, well, clearly it's not a problem. And, but th this, is the, this is where people get injured. The amount of nurses who get injured, the amount of um, uh, allied health professionals and, and uh, support workers in hospitals who get injured, and the patient clearly it doesn't know what they're doing, but it doesn't take away from that it was a violent situation. Not, not necessarily a malicious situation, but violent. And then if that is reported, then that will help a lot to be able to be resourced appropriately, as opposed to people continually getting injured. I was just going to say, recently um, I present data to, to our different departments and recently we did some training with our ICU staff and I said, congratulations, last year you didn't have one incident of verbal aggression in your <laughs> ICU department because there wasn't one report. And so when they look at the data and they go, ah, oh, and I said, so as far as I'm concerned, you don't have a problem because I don't, there's no reporting of it. So, you know, it, it sort of just brought home to them, oh, we have a big problem, but no one knows about it. Yeah. Okay. Patrice, did you want to answer anything on that? Well, I, only just that I think taking action when incidents are reported helps with that. Creating a, a, a culture within the organisation that encourages reporting mm -hmm. um, and shows action is, is another way. And of course, just increasing awareness across the board that and it's not acceptable is and really the way we're going to go. the evidence that comes with reporting is good food for, for the mill for your folk to be able to build up a better understanding of the regulatory Absolutely. environment. We use all the data that comes to us around understanding the issue and you know, and also then if you get the information around what's happened, at what the causes, and then we can actually focus our attention and resources. If we've got limited resources, let's focus it in the right way. And we can only do that if we know what, where to focus it. Yeah. So there's a gentleman here. Uh, just simply, how would you, how would the, do these issues translate into the primary healthcare sector AKA GP, GP clinics, clinics, specialist clinics, which physically are built in a different way and for which the, the staff and the clinicians may not have the same protections. Yeah, uh, look, I think that's a big issue. We, I mean, we have staff like our pathology staff who might be working within a GP clinic. Um, and so because they fit under our umbrella, we provide them with some training and our OHNS department will go out and look at their environment. But whether that happens with, you know, um, individual or independent, you know, GP clinics, I, I think at the, t at the moment it sort of sits with, you know, the, those independent and what they're prepared to put in. Yeah, yeah. And so, think, yeah, they're left, I think. I think this is a classic um, point that uh, Patrice has made. In terms of under-reporting, I'm sitting here thinking that um, those clinics are probably pretty good. You know, they've probably got a, you know, a piano in the corner there or something along those lines, and it's all very nice. <laughs> yeah. But clearly, when you think about it, yes, these things would be occurring there. The frustrations and concerns, particularly when, you know, some people are struggling to be able to afford to see a doctor and those sorts of things as well. So those pressures and stresses would be there, but uh, if I'm sitting here thinking that well, it's not a real issue, um, this is where I think pressure's got to be put on that people do report those things and we can start to address those as well. Okay, and another... Can I just say, oh, yep. from a regulated perspective, we expect that any workplace has actually looked and identified their risks and implemented appropriate controls and ongoing monitoring of that. So just because you're a small general practice doesn't mean that you're not obligated to do that. So, And their risks might be totally different and they 
don't need a code grey response team, but they, might, they, they, they do need to know that this might happen and what do we do in that situation if it does, or how can we prevent it? Yeah. Question down here. Yes, thanks. Patrice, you mentioned the role of the community. I wondered if you could say more about what the community can, how the community can be part of the solution, whether we have talked a lot about the, what workplaces can do and the interaction there, but obviously the impact of workplace violence goes beyond just the workers and it goes into the community. So, yeah, is it, more, is it just being aware is, is, or is there more that the community can do? I think it, it's not just being aware, it's about having the attitude that it's not okay um, and that, you know, everyone I think has been in a situation where you're frustrated with something and you might feel like um, verbally attacking someone for a, 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 something because of a system issue, but I think it's really important to understand that the people that you might be abusing are not the people that are actually have created the issue. There's systemic issues that actually need to be dealt with that can um, change that. And it really isn't okay to, to be attacking our people who are actually trying to care for a <laughs> people who are ill. Yep. Um, can, can I just jump in there? Because I think that's a really important issue. And I'll just raise this at the moment. Our, our union with others has supported the lockout laws in New South Wales. Um, there's a whole heap of backlash on that. There's a whole heap of community debate on that. For us, we see a decrease in assaults of over 37 to 40% of people. A decrease presentation in um, emergency departments by about 35%. These are good uh, outcomes, but the community wants to push back. So I think it's a debate we have to bring the community with us. It's a societal change that we're seeing. And people have different points of view, and, and there's, you know, we need to engage that. But we can't have paramedics, nurses, doctors, clinicians uh, being punching bags because people just don't get it. But it's, we are absolutely obligated to educate people as to why, and I say this from the time kids are in school, that social behaviour doesn't need to get out of control. Social behaviour in the next 25 years needs to be respectful and, and, and work with people at, at every level. Yeah, well, I was going to say St Vincent Sydney was certainly very instrumental in um, helping um, bring about some of the, the discussions around the lockout laws. Um, and in, you know, in Victoria, we don't have lockout laws, but um, we certainly, you know, I think um, even just from a clinician's point of view, there is this, you know, um, idea occasionally that it is okay to have a go. Um, and I think sometimes that's about choices, about what people make and who they think that they can speak to. Um, you know, healthcare is predominantly female, um, and I think that that, that needs to be, you know, that's recognised. something to be recognised, yep. And, um, you know, so there's a whole, you know, society sort of norm at play in a way. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, the community has a big part to have a look at it kind of reflect it at itself to sort of say, well, you know, if I see a, a family member, you know, maybe I do need to step in and say that it's not appropriate and, you know, um, and have a discussion or think a little bit about what you're going to be like under distress and how you're going to, to manage that. And not everyone has the resources, or, you know, or it. the education or yep. the foresight, but at least if we get the discussion happening, you start making people have some reflection. So going back to Michael's opening comments, they were quite stridently around hoping to move us to a national, more of a national focus around this. Let's advance our thinking to 2025. Now, I'd ask as closing comments to go and give some thoughts as to what a successful system would look like by 2025. Now, we're not talking a decade here, yeah. we're talking upwards of seven yeah. years, okay? What are some of the key things, key yeah. messages that we would like to sort of inform people in government, inform people who are doing the design of workspaces, yeah. informing the community about better respect. Yeah. And I'll start with you, Tiffany. Well, I would say that it's everybody's responsibility. Okay. You know, that we need to make sure that everyone has a part to play in it. You know, it doesn't just happen when you, auto, you know, suddenly are involved in the healthcare system, you know, and then you see it and then you go, oh, this is awful that this is happening, you know. There needs to be broader recognition earlier on. 
by a whole, we, you know, as a community, as Australians, this is our responsibility. And what happens in your workspace right at the front door where the police are bringing them in? Yep, is so there I a change in design? Really, Do vehicles need yep, to be redesigned? I just think good communication between the stakeholders. I think that's really important. So continuing to okay. broaden those um, really good um, communications between all the relevant parties and, and get them on board about how things are done. I think that's something in Victoria we've seen that's been really, really helpful and, and that can only improve. You know, okay. there's a, a way to go. Jared? I think it's all about, um, from the top down, transparency. Um, decisions that are being made need to be made openly, clearly and being are able to be explained. And they're made on the back of information that's been supplied from thorough consultation with the, not only the community but health workers, right from uh, whether it's a, the clinicians, the paramedics, the nurses, the uh, food services people, the security officers, right the way through. Um, the, the, the most important thing, and I'm, I continue to harp on this, you, you get nowhere unless you're prepared to invest. And we know and we hear all the time how much the health system costs. But the health system will cost more if people cannot be cared for when they get within the system. And less functional. A absolutely less functional. And we've mentioned things about attraction and retention. Yep. Uh, injuries alone will put people out of the workforce. So there's a whole range of issues, but they need to be, and I think, dealt with on a national basis, consistent across the nation. And so no matter which state you're working in, we all understand how the rules apply. Apply nationally. Patrice? Uh, and I agree what both, um, with what both Gerard and Tiffany have said. I think we need to just keep, like, and keep working together across the government, across you know borders. Um, but I also think we need to integrate it more into just the normal. Like hospitals have a lot of performance management systems and things that um, things that commitments that they have to make. And if if we can integrate and accreditation and things like that, if we can integrate this as part of the measurement and bring it up to that level, that um, it becomes one of the other things like, you know, meeting their budget targets, yes. then that's going to make a big difference because that then means that the, the top level of the organisations have to focus on it and then that creates systems approaches down below to make those So it's happen. working in both directions from the top down yeah. and the bottom up. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that brings us close to our time for today and I want to thank you for your participation, but could I ask you to thank the panel for their involvement? <laughs>